This is the Winning in Winnipeg podcast, where we talk to top performing business owners, executives, entrepreneurs, and local Winnipeg celebrities. We get to learn who they are, how they think, and we get to hear their perspective about what's really going on in Winnipeg and their businesses. Today, I have Dr. Pascal Breton. He practices at his Lindenwood Chiropractic Clinic here in Winnipeg. And it's actually one that I've been going to for almost a year now, where I've seen absolutely incredible results. But that's not the only thing. I, I initially was connected you to you by a trusted friend of mine in the States who knows you very well and had amazing things to say about you. Uh, top of your class, graduated summa cum laude, chosen as the valedict- valedictorian. So not only incredibly good shape, good looking, but you're smart. So, huh, look at that. <laughs> Father, husband, uh, I've heard you shred guitar, beast of an athlete, uh, level two CrossFit, right? Yes. Uh, uh, and simply by looking at you, clearly a CrossFit participant and a business owner and, and successful one at that. So I know that there's a ton more that I could tell everyone that I know about you, but I want you to tell it. So... Uh, first question, super serious question. It's probably going to put you right on the spot, but your friends nicknamed you turbo. Mm. So there's gotta be a story behind that. (laughs) Yeah, there is. There's a, there's a few ways I was nicknamed turbo. Well, number one, I guess it was always my energy, right? Go, 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 go. So, so as a kid, as a young man, I've always been on the go, slowing down and resting or doing nothing is probably the hardest task in the world for me. And actually one that I'm trying to focus on more now, not to just, overdo things and yeah, learn how to, to be relaxed and sit and do nothing. It's, that's a very challenging task for me. So as a young man, a lot of my friends would call me turbo because I was always high energy and go, go, go. And then it was affiliated with the fact that my very first car was a Dodge 600 SE turbo, the old K car from my grandpa. So good. It was a turbo, right? So it was kind of the, I guess, the link between the two. And so um, it became turbo. And then I guided at a fishing lodge actually with our um, mutual friend, Ryan Ryan Hewitt. We were both fishing guides there. And at the fishing lodge, because it was like a little family owned place, there were three Pascals, right? And so Pascal (laughs) is a very, no one, it's an uncommon name, but there were three working on a staff of 12 people all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is not gonna work basically. You call Pascal's name and then three people look over at you. And so those nicknames really got ingrained while we worked at that fishing lodge. We became um, turbo diesel and points. And so 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 the nicknames stuck. So the people who still call me Turbo (laughs) to this day is anybody that I worked at at that fishing lodge for years as a young man. Yeah. If I I still see them, they'll still call me Turbo. It's it's stuck. I like it. Yeah. 1976 Old Mobile Cutlass Supreme. Nice. It came from my baba. Right. It went through pretty much every single uh, cousin or grandson nice and all of us have stories about it right the first cars those are hilarious they're the best I right know. you're so grateful to have any car i mean maybe anything things have changed a little bit today but yeah. back then i was just so happy i had a vehicle yeah, yeah. and you know gold k car with like sort of a, <laughs> a red burgundy interior but yeah. you know grandparent driven it had like seventeen thousand kilometers on it right it was like a brand new car yeah so it's great it's so good yeah um so fishing yes like, Fishing is clearly a big part of your life. It's a big passion. So did it start very early on? Yes. And how has it become now such a big part of your life? Like, how do you? Um, So the very first time I went fishing, I was eight years old. My uncle, who's a big time outdoorsman, he loves the outdoors. And I'm still very close with him. We actually went fishing together this summer. And so he took me when I was eight years old into this park called the Nopaming Park up this little river called the Rabbit River. And so my dad, who was not, I don't think, an outdoorsman whatsoever, my uncle convinced him, like, let's go on this weekend canoe trip. we got to paddle eight hours up this little river. We'll camp on this lake. It's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, lo and behold, first camping trip, it's wind is blowing at our head. My dad and uncle are paddling as hard as they can. I'm eight years old. I'm just sitting in the middle of the canoe having a great time. Mm -hmm. But there's headwinds and it's raining and so on and so forth. And kind of miserable to get into the lake. But then when we got there, you know, first fishing experience, we were catching 
probably a hundred fish a day, just one after another, nonstop, just unbelievable fishing. And from that moment on, I was hooked. And so ever since then, I've always loved fishing, but really remote fishing. So, you know, fishing on a big lake, like going to fish somewhere in a big boat, Lake Winnipeg with lots of boat traffic around and sailboats, that stuff doesn't interest me as much as that experience that I got as a young man. It's getting to these backcountry remote lakes where you can really enjoy wilderness. And I think, you know, the added advantage or the bonus is catching fish. And so that's, that's what, what I, I really say. enjoyed. Yeah, that's yeah. the hardest part about fishing is not catching fish, fish, right? Yes. Do you think that's what cemented it early on? Is like absolutely just hundreds of fish. fish. A day? Yeah. Had right. I gone to an experience where we sat in a boat all day and caught two fish? Yeah. yeah. To this day, I don't know if I would love it the same. See, and I have a hard time. Like I, I, someone asked me if I wanted to go fishing somewhere where the the opportunity to only catch one or two fish throughout the day. Yeah. I don't think I would like it the same as somewhere where I catch multiple multiple fish throughout the day right and i still go to that park like i was there last weekend with my brother-in-law and my niece to that same park to go fishing because it's still wonderful fishing you can still get into some of those lakes and it's wonderful so you're actually the guy that i need to go fishing with yes because i never catch anything <laughs> no okay ever that's what i always like, tell people it's I, incredible i have a long list of people that i i like to bring fishing and i go fishing with because it's a great experience right you yeah. you go out to those places there's no internet reception there's virtually no cell phone reception mm -hmm. and so talking about slowing down though yes it's an activity to get there once i'm there i slow down and it's one of the only i think activities where i am not the, worried the, about the outside the turbo world. goes down yeah just sit there have a conversation with somebody and catch fish and enjoy nature now you have two kids two yes how are you introducing them to fishing to make sure that it's a win the first time well we did it this year actually so my, really? my wife and i took them into go figure one of those backcountry lakes okay uh, i took my son twice so far i've taken my daughter once and so we knew it wasn't going to last long we just wanted to bring them into the boat have fun hopefully catch a fish or two and get out so the, yeah. the first experience lasted 45 minutes so it was a lot of work so hike into this lake hike all the gear in get the boat set up get in boat around a little bit we caught two tiny little fish they yeah. thought it was the greatest thing yeah. out we went and off we went and then we went back the very next day and did the same thing and they were actually excited to go so that's what we wanted right mm -hmm. they were more concerned with playing with the earthworms and looking at all the hooks and lures but just being outdoors we wanted them to enjoy that experience right and so they did and then so later on the same summer that was in may in july i went back to the, the same lake with my son and then also my father-in-law so we went kind of like three generational fishing and this time i'm like okay i'll push it two hours and so we went two hours and we caught a lot of fish actually we caught about 18 fish the first day in two hours and about 15 Pick fish the second girl? day what are you guys uh, those were bass and, and big pike nice yeah so my son got to experience pretty good fishing pretty early and and he liked it he was actually scared of the bigger fish but yeah. Yeah, he's, he's okay with the small ones. He doesn't like the big ones yet. That's actually a, an incredible lesson almost in there as far as introducing kids to things. Yes. Right? Yeah. Almost ensuring success yes. that first time, just so that first impression of anything would be that way. For sure. And a lot of people told me that don't go all day. Like that's the a surefire right. way to ruin them. Right. Pl plan an hour, two hours tops and get out. Yeah, yeah. And so the first few experiences have been very short. And so far they've enjoyed it and they, they love fishing, right? They love the idea and they have their little, like my son's got the Spider-Man rod. My daughter had the Paw Patrol rod that mm -hmm. they could cast with no hook, right? They just mm. kind of pitch it, reel it in, pitch it, reel it in. So yeah. they've had some experiences. They seem to like it. And I think they just like being in the boat, yeah, yeah. being outdoors too. So is it all outdoor stuff or you, do you, do you hunt, do you camp, do you, or is it like, is fishing the... I like fishing. I love fishing. I think yep. that's just one of the outdoor activities that I enjoy the most. Okay. You know, I think I would enjoy, I've done some hiking. I haven't done some in years, like Manterio trail hiking, things like that. Yeah. Fishing would be probably my first love outdoors, but yeah, we love camping. Mm -hmm. We go camping all the time with the family to, to just to be outdoors and hike little trails, go to the beach and be on the water, whether it's canoeing or just being outdoors. So I absolutely right. love it. Hunting <sighs> doesn't appeal to me as much. Mm -hmm. Um, few reasons generally hunting is a longer uh, time frame like you know if someone goes hunting it's three four five days and sometimes a week yep. and so trying to take that much time off of work number one and then two family it's almost impossible so right. it's an activity that interests me but less because you know uh, killing a large animal to me is still much harder than a fish right and i know that may seem funny to some people listening while well, you're killing a fish you're killing an animal but a small fish is is easier than 
seeing a large mammal die for me. I, I have a hard time with that still to this day. Yeah. And so, so yeah, there's the time element, family element, and still, I guess, my side of, uh, of having a hard time seeing that. Yeah. So those are all the elements that take me away from hunting, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Well, being outdoors, I mean, that really ties into your profession, right? Like yeah. being outdoors is, is you're going to be healthier than if you're indoors. So one of the things I really love about you is you practice what you preach, right? It's it's like having a fat doctor, yeah. right? Or, or like a poor wealth management consultant. consultant yes. But as a healthcare provider, um, I imagine that you believe that health is pretty much the catalyst uh, uh, of a good life. Correct. Right. So why is it so hard for people simply to figure out what's best for their health? That's a great question. You know, I think a lot of it probably starts young childhood, right? Getting people moving. I think if you can get, I always say body in motion stays in motion. Mm -hmm. And the more sedentary you become, the further you go down that route, the road, pardon me, or that route, mm -hmm. the harder it becomes to undo it. So I think it's like this vicious cycle. But I, I think activity is number one. And yes, being outdoors is a perfect example of on a weekend, I, I don't want to sit around at home. I want to be outside. I just want to move regardless of what that is. Movement is key to life. And so I think getting people moving is the hardest thing. But when you don't move and you haven't been moving, you become sedentary, you become tired, right? And that that is like this vicious cycle. You're like, well, I'm too tired to move. I'm too tired to do something. I think I just need to be here and rest because if I go do this activity and I'm moving, it's gonna make me more tired. But it's actually quite the opposite, which I'm sure you've experienced. You're tired, maybe you didn't wanna go on one of the runs for training for your marathon. Yep. And then by the time you do it, you know, you're maybe fatigued in a different sense, but here mentally, psychologically, you're extremely stimulated and you actually have more energy to be productive and do things. So I think the hardest thing is just getting people moving. They have to start. Starting is key, building momentum, and then keeping that momentum in movement. Right. That, that to me, would be the key to getting people to be healthy. Yeah. Because that's a loaded, I mean, there's... Oh, so much in there, right? Right. But if you're trying to dissect, if, if you could ask me what would be the number one thing that I could give anybody, if it was one piece of advice... Well, now I don't have to ask you. <laughs> yeah, the one, piece, one yeah. piece of advice I would give someone, it's move more. Yeah. You know, and... I think the older I get, the more I realize that that movement doesn't have to be, you know, intense exercise. As much as I love the intense exercise for the feeling that I get and, you know, the, the, the benefits that it would give someone for um, strength, physique, all of the above, mm -hmm. the, I guess, key ingredient to getting someone to be healthy has nothing to do with necessarily that intensity. It's just the motion and the movement. So walking, Tai Chi, yoga, all of these exercise forms that cause multiple joints in the body to move yeah. are going to give you that same sort of psychological stimulation, reducing stress, helping blood flow, keeping the joints moving, all of the above. Yeah. So it's not about intense exercise. Sometimes people think that, well, you know, they're scared to embark on an exercise program. Well, just start walking three, four days a week. Start there, mm -hmm. right? It has to be that simple. A few stretches and a little bit of walking will give you a lot of the benefits that you need to become healthier and build that momentum. Right. One is better than zero. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's a, you have a, everyone has a large origin story about kind of who they are, how yes. they became what they, what is the part that, you know, when, when you were growing up and, and leading, it's kind of a two part question, but leading into uh, school and your developmental years, as far as your mindset and a, a chosen profession, how did you grow up and why chiropractic mm -hmm. and, and where did that? So a lot of people don't know. My dad was a chiropractor and he okay. practiced for years. So I've been under chiropractic care my whole life. Oh, that's and, why you're straight. And that's the mindset. Well, <laughs> as much as possible. That's why you're straighter than me. Yeah. So, so that mindset was ingrained into me from a very young age of, right. Of like taking care of yourself and health being like the pinnacle resource of life. If, 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 if you're striving for one thing, it's health, right? You can always try and make more money, but you know, the paradox of man being that you cannot regain health once you've lost it, or it's much harder to regain health than it is wealth, right? right. And so there's, you know, so many proverbs, if you will, or sayings that revolve around the true meaning of wealth is, is having the best health possible. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with that being number one. And so I always wanted to 
probably be in the health field and help people in some way, shape or form become healthier. And I think as I started doing university, I had a really hard time going turbo, right? Being like sitting still was just a challenge for me. I had a really hard time with undergrad because I did not like to sit still. By the time I was finished my undergrad, I decided, okay, I can't do grad school. There's no way I could do another four years of, of sitting in a chair and studying. To me, it was a small form of torture. And so, uh, I got into CrossFit and I really came close to opening a CrossFit gym because there's a lot of parallels there. As I mentioned to you, the biggest thing, get people moving. I love exercise and I think you can really make a significant impact on people's health if you can get them moving. And so I looked into getting a CrossFit gym and then shortly before I actually like put the pen to the paper to, to buy in, to be a partner in one of the first CrossFit gyms in Winnipeg, large turn of events, we won't go there, but I decided not to do it. And then that was kind of like an aha moment where I decided, no, I think I need to go back to school and, and follow my passion and be a chiropractor and, and do what I believe in and, and know that being a chiropractor, I would have more tools at my disposal, my, at my disposal to help people get healthier. I could still teach people exercises, but now I can help them with their spine, their overall health, their posture. I can teach them about nutrition. So I'd have a, I guess, a larger umbrella under which I could help people. So That's then I decided to, to go back to school, suck it up and go back to school and become yeah. a chiropractor. Yeah. I too was going to open a CrossFit gym. That's awesome. Cause I, I thought it was the greatest thing ever when I first found it. Yeah. And yeah, I was on that at that, at a different same table. Yeah. Ready to sign something and, and go with it. And yeah, that fell apart too. And it just didn't happen. But I think it's, uh, I mean, it happens for a reason for sure. Right. But, um, becoming a chiropractor. Yes. Did you always, were you ever always in the mindset of, I want to be a business owner? Were you unemployable? Right. Or is it simply a function of the profession? Hmm. Like, is that what most chiropractors do? There's some that work without owning a business. That's a great question. Yeah. So uh, was I unemployable? Probably. Because <laughs> I am. Long-term. I'm unemployable. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right. I think if you're an entrepreneur in some way, you're unemployable to a certain extent, right? Yep. Because you end up dreams, vision, drive. And it's hard to, I, I think, stay under somebody else's lead when you want to be a leader. Mm-hmm. So I think in many ways, yes, I think the nature of the profession and yes, to some extent being unemployable. And so when I finished school, uh, I worked at a very large rehabilitation clinic called the Ideal Spine Health Center. And that's probably, in my opinion, the I think they're like the foremost clinic in our profession worldwide. They're the ones that are producing the largest amount of research. You know, the traction tables that are at our office, they are the ones that really developed traction, spinal remodeling. And so they- Is that here? No, it's in Eagle, Idaho. Okay. And so I, I gravitated towards them while I was in school because of all this research they were putting out. I thought it was really cool that they were sort of doing this cutting edge stuff and everything that you're taught in school, they were sort of putting into practice. Right. They were creating what's called operational definitions. So they were saying, okay, yes, you know, we can do X, Y, and Z and chiropractic and help people with, uh, you know, these conditions and these problems. Mm-hmm. Well, here is you know, the, the actual mechanical operational side. This is how we measure it pre post. This is how we show it on x-rays. And so they had done this, this great job of establishing all of it in the research. Mm -hmm. And so because they were doing that, I said, okay, well, I'm going to gravitate towards these guys. And so I got an internship with them right when I was done school. And I spent a lot of time in that center learning about proper spine rehab, learning about uh, all of the research behind normal spines and so on and so forth. And so what was really cool about working there is every three months, you'd have about 50 doctors who would fly in to train. They would come train, they would come learn. Mm -hmm. And so me being an intern, I would sit in on all of these classroom hours and I would learn from Dr. Deed Harrison, who was kind of the lead, the lead researcher. And so I would sit and learn and I would always ask these chiropractors coming in, okay, Where's your practice? How are you working? What are you doing? I had this really unique situation where I I could pick the brains of hundreds of professionals who were just starting practice or years into practice. And so obviously, naturally, you know, you always say, you know, follow wisdom, follow success. So I would ask the chiropractors who'd been in it for 10 plus years, what are you doing? If you could start over again, what would you do? Right. And so many of them said, don't open your own practice. Really? Absolutely. So many of them said, you know, you need to find someone who's like-minded, mm-hmm. same goals, visions as you, mm-hmm. and share space, 
right? Because then you're just simply sharing overhead with somebody else mm-hmm. that has the same vision and there's less stress and pressure on you to try and pay the bills day in, day mm-hmm. out to run a clinic that can be, you know, $30,000 a month to try and run a clinic. Well, why have one person tr- trying to see patients and bring an in income to cover that when you can have two, three doctors, depending on the size of the space, yep. but you have to be like-minded. And so coming back to Winnipeg, I'm not the one that opened Linden Woods Chiropractic. Mm-hmm. It's actually been there for, I think, 35 plus years now. Crazy. And Dr. Dan, who was there before me, he bought it about 14 years ago. Mm-hmm. And I've known him for years just from the French community. And yep. when I was going to school, because he graduated before me, he said, if, if and when you get back to Winnipeg, let me know. Come join me at the clinic. And so eventually. And that was that. That life happens. Yeah, we, my wife got pregnant. Decided we're going to have kids. And then Winnipeg was the place we were going to call home for family reasons. Right. And so moved back to Winnipeg and I called up Dr. Dan and I said, hey, I'm ready to join the clinic now. And so, yeah, we partnered up. And and then so basically it's it's a form of running two businesses. He's technically the main chattel business owner. Mm -hmm. But then I have my own clientele patient base. So running like a almost like a subcontractor, if you will, inside that clinic. Right. Yeah. Why, why is chiropractic and I'll preface this when I was growing up, I I was never under chiropractic care. Yeah. I did a lot of intense sports. Yeah. Football, rugby, hard hitting, like just absolutely destroying my body. Um, Chiropractic, my, my first intro to it was actually a like a tmj like a jaw issue right and i was cheering at a rider game that could be rough rider game (laughs) yeah but my jaw locked locked up yeah you know this is the weirdest thing so i went to a chiropractor and i first of all i had no idea about chiropractic so it was fix my jaw yeah don't fix the rest of my body don't look at the rest fix my jaw and at the time i was very closed mind about well, pretty much everything. Yeah. Right. So I left there not with the answers that I wanted. Uh, it seems that as I've realized that I didn't know everything, that I started learning more about health and, and the body and even life in general, that I've come more towards chiropractic. I've seen that more chiropractors are more growth oriented. I see more chiropractors uh, in leadership courses, in, you know, uh, men's groups. Yeah. Um, and overall, I, I feel like chiropractors are the leaders of health or functional health. Why is that? Why is chiropractic, which some consider still to this day frou-frou in the air yes like i i I talk with mds and they're just like you know some some don't even some don't even won't even look at you but from a functional standpoint it's it makes so much sense to me why the huge disconnect so that's a great question and there's a lot of like I don't know, sub questions in there. There's all kinds of, I was going to say, how long do we have? Right? We've got a hard stop. So, so let's start, like, let's just go to the history of chiropractic that most people don't even know about. Okay. okay. So the history of chiropractic, 1895, a gentleman named Didi Palmer, he has a, I guess, you know, the word would be janitor back then they called him a janitor, but a custodian was working in his building and he was a magnetic healer, right? So he had crystals, magnets. So he was a little bit, you know, flu flu and out there. So mm-hmm. the, I guess, the person who established chiropractic already had a reputation for being uh, very eccentric and out there in his views, philosophies. Mm-hmm. But this um, janitor had lost his hearing. He had something, I can't remember exactly the story, but something had hit him on the head, hit him on the back of the head, and he had lost his hearing after the injury. Well, D.D. Palmer had noticed that he had this very large lump right at the base of the skull below his right ear. And he thought, well, that's weird. That shouldn't be there. It's not like the other side. Now, what possessed him to think that he should push on it as hard as he could? But he basically gave him the first adjustment. He pushed on that bone as hard as he could. Crack. Janitor's hearing came back. And he thought, wow, that's really cool. So the very first adjustment ever given had nothing to do <laughs> with pain, right? Okay. And so right away, D.D. Palmer thought, well, if that bone can control hearing, 
what else could the bones or what else could the spine be involved in terms of functionality, right. healing, and so on and so forth. And so chiropractic was actually designed as a healing profession, not a pain profession. So those first chiropractors in the early 20s and 30s and 1940s were really much more interested. They were all trained to become holistic doctors, if you will, in a way. It was like, well, if we can keep that spine healthy, we can keep the nervous system flowing, basically brain to body communication and connection. Well, they got to be very, very, very popular. You had people that were lined up outside of clinics then. They would wait for hours to get adjusted by certain chiropractors because they believed that, you know, keeping my spine healthy would keep me healthy and functioning. Mm -hmm. The same paradigm that I was grown up, you know, with. And I will say I had a pretty darn healthy childhood. Mm -hmm. Was it because of chiropractic, the movement? Uh, was it because my dad was into, you know, organic healthy foods trying to, 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 to make us eat properly? probably all of the above, but that was the field. That was the mindset. That's what we believed in. And so at some point, you know, there was the medical association didn't like what they were seeing. They were saying chiropractors were practicing medicine without a license. They don't have proper training. Let's crush them. Mm -hmm. And this actually happened. The, the American medical association in the fifties and sixties developed a committee, a, a committee, uh, on quackery. They called chiropractic quackery. And they put a lot of money in, and the specific goal was to sort of destroy chiropractic, right? And so they started putting out campaigns and billboards, and it was all about chiropractors being these snake oil salesmen, uneducated quacks that were really dangerous and they were practicing medicine without a license. Mm -hmm. And the amount of money and effort that went in significantly tarnished chiropractors like reputation and mm -hmm. the profession as a whole. Now the chiropractors stood up for themselves. They took the American Medical Association to court and I believe it was in the 70s. They actually won and sued the American Medical Association for basically unjust harm that was put onto our profession. Yeah. But you can't take back what was done. And since that time, we've always been the snake oil salesmen, the eccentric quacks and so that tarnished, I think, chiropractic's reputation, and it's been really hard to come back from that. Mm -hmm. And then because of that, I think you have a portion of the profession that then gravitated and said, well, let's move into pain because now we're not stepping on, you know, the medical body's expertise, which was supposed to be health, taking care of patients. If we just focus on pain, well, let's face it, you know, there's, when you go see a doctor, if it's pain, it's either a prescription or physio type rehab, right? So they said, let's focus on pain because there's a huge market here for helping people with pain. Mm -hmm. And we know that as we adjust the spine and we move the bones, people's pain goes down or goes away. And so chiropractic then sort of divided itself where you have a large part of the profession that focuses only on pain and you still have a big portion of the profession that stayed true to the roots of being these healthcare holistic leaders, trying to not only get someone's posture to be better. Yes, I want your pain to go away, but ultimately I want you to be the best version of yourself. Right. And so the, the profession kind of split from that point. And that's where I gravitated towards this type of chiropractic called chiropractic biophysics, because they said, well, let's prove in the science, mm -hmm. this mind body connection. Let's prove that if we improve the spinal position, if we improve the mechanics and position of the spine, that we can measure these improvements, whether it's in pain, headaches, nervous system function, autonomic nervous system. So they're measuring all these different things and showing that, yeah, when we bring the spine back to normal, we're having a significant impact on health and the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so it's above and beyond pain. And so, yes, it's still holistic, but it's the, the, the waters are muddied, if that makes sense. And that's, that's in, in large part why chiropractic has never become mainstream. Mm -hmm. And why we've always, I guess, sort of rubbed medical doctors the wrong way. It goes back to, I guess, the history of chiropractic. And I think it's changing a lot now, mm -hmm. especially as we're getting more research that is supporting what we're doing and establishing things. It's no longer considered quackery. You can show someone that, hey, look, this has been done in the research, peer reviewed. This is scientific. Mm -hmm. There's proof to show that what we're doing has good value. Right. And here's the metrics. Correct. To back it up, which is which is huge part of it. Yeah. How much do you find in your personal experience is prevention versus actual hmm. acute pain or, or, or healing. But like, like right now I'm, I think we've been through some of the worst already, Yep. but now like I'm coming legitimately because even if you told me to stop, yeah. I'd probably still keep coming 
once every week, once every two weeks, simply to to feel good, keep things as part of a prevention plan that I believe in. Yeah. Right. Um, what's everyone else looking like? It's a good question. I think you've got like politics, you know, you've got people that stand on both ends of the spectrum. We have a lot of patients. I have patients from the day that I moved back to Winnipeg. I have people that have been with me since day one, specifically for those reasons, whether they came to see me in a crisis, very often someone comes to see you for an issue specifically because they're still of that mindset that chiropractors deal with pain, not preventative health, proactive health. And so someone comes to see me with neck pain. Well, they come see us, we take some x-rays, we show them what's going on, we help them get better and they go, wow, I've never felt so good. You know, what should I do to keep feeling this good? Well, you know, everything that you did to get you here, exercises, stretches, proper nutrition and getting adjusted can help keep you there. Just like if you had never brushed your teeth or taken care of your teeth, you'd have a lot of work to do before you can get to a maintenance level and only seeing a dentist once every six months. Mm -hmm. The idea is the same. At first, people are kind of in a crisis acute mode and it takes a lot of work to get them out of that. But once they get out of that, they can just go along their merry way. Now, if someone was, you know, doing yoga every day, drinking green smoothies, hanging upside down and doing all the proper spinal mobility, would they have to see me to, to help them keep their spine in check? Probably not. Does that make sense? But how many people don't have kids, have no stress, don't sit all day, uh, aren't doing things that are jamming up their spines and creating issues? And the biggest one being sedentary living. I will tell you, I've seen football athletes who've been crushed and incredibly you know, bad hits. And then I'll, I've seen the person who sits at a desk for eight hours a day, ask me which one has more spinal problems, the one that sits at a desk. Mm -hmm. So the movement, even though if it has injuries is so much more important than someone, or it has, uh, has a trade off of health benefits versus sitting. And so, yeah, people can benefit from continued chiropractic care to maintain their spine and maintain their health mm -hmm. because the things that will break you down are never going away. And that's emotional stress, physical stress, sedentary living. Those things will continue to put your spine into a bad position, build tension to the muscles, create stiffness, scar tissue, and joint issues. So I would say most people come to see us for acute care at first. Plenty of them stay on later as they realize how good they can feel and function with, you know, um, maintenance care once a week, once every two weeks, once a month. Mm -hmm. So of those three, four, five things, would you say that the worst thing that anyone can do is just sedentary lifestyle? Yes. Right. Not moving. Absolutely. Absolutely. Going back to your movement yeah. is pretty much the number one thing that people can do. For sure. I think the expression sitting is the new smoking. If I, if I recall correctly, mm -hmm. it was Dr. Peter Atia. Now listen to his podcast, the drive. It's very good. Yeah. He was talking about a study or when they had started to ban smoking in office buildings, they had looked at like health profiles. So cholesterol, we'll say, we'll say blood tests of these different uh, persons working in the office. And back then way more people smoked. So you had the non-smokers and the smokers. Well, the non-smokers would go down the stairs in the building two, three times a day to go have their smoke outside, mm -hmm. right? Versus those who didn't smoke, well, didn't really get up from their computers. And so though you think the smoking would be worse for you, who had the better blood profile? The smokers or the ones who were sedentary? And it was actually the smokers no, I, for the simple reason that they were actually no. going down the stairs two, three times a day to go have their smoke. Really? They were getting better blood profiles and better blood markers than the ones who were sedentary sitting at their desk. Hmm. And I believe that's where you've heard the expression sitting is the new smoking. Mm -hmm. I think that's where that expression came out of was that one study. And so, yeah, I would tell you like smokers who are active and move are probably healthier than someone who doesn't smoke, but doesn't get up from their desk, doesn't do extracurricular activities or exercise. I think sedentary living is, is the killer. And it, we look at it now with like diabetes and blood sugar type issues. You know, it, you could go do a super intense workout, right? And then go crush three or four cookies after and have very little blood sugar response, very little like insulin type of, uh, of the issues without, you know, getting too much into health markers. Mm -hmm. You could eat high sugar, high carb foods after doing an intense workout and your body will use it up like that. Mm -hmm. You eat that after sitting at your desk for eight hours because you're tired and craving something, you'll have a massive blood sugar spike and you're going to sleep 15 minutes later because your body can't regulate sugar like that. Right. So, you know, for your blood sugar, your physiology, all of the above. I mean, yeah. If mm -hmm. all, all the things I mentioned, to me, it's it's exercise. Movement is the key to life. Yeah. Yes, I think good nutrition is is great. But look at the CrossFit games. When Rich Froning won the CrossFit games, he was eating pizza and junk food and 
you know, you could still burn that fuel. Now, over time, if you had a choice between good fuel, bad fuel, yep. good fuel is great. Yep. But if you ask me between proper nutrition and exercise, I'd probably choose exercise, believe mm. it or not. Yeah. Overall, above and beyond anything else. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's the number one for me is exercise. Crazy. Yeah. What is when you, um, as, as like a, not a, as a subcontractor or, um, you know, an independent owner, co-owner, yeah. um, you are, you're practicing directly in the business. Yes. What is the hardest part about owning your own practice, having to market, yep. sell, do all the things that entrepreneurs and business owners do while still having to focus and work in the business. And what is the time spent between the two, right? Like you do, you know, what I really like. And when I started getting your emails and seeing the blogs and seeing the, the, uh, the videos and, you know, everything to go along with, with actual education marketing and, um, you know, that follows into sales and everything like that. But how much are you intentionally dedicating to working in the business and on the business? I bet you it's 50, 50. I'd be, I'd be willing to say it's close to 50, 50. You know, sometimes people look at our hours. If you look at our actual treatment hours or adjusting hours, okay, it's 24 hours a week. So a lot of people think, wow, you know, why don't you guys work more? Why don't you guys work longer? And it's probably close to a one-to-one, if not maybe, okay, let's call it two-to-one clinic time versus business time on the back end. Mm -hmm. But you still have 12, at least 12 hours a week, if not more, on back-end work to build the business, Mm -hmm. okay? Um, You know, building the business, marketing, man, that's tough. We've tried different avenues, and a lot of it was easier pre-COVID because we would go into businesses and do talks. Like, I've done many talks at the running room. You know, for runners talking about prevention from injuries and how posture can affect, you know, runners. And, and Dr. Dan does a lot with teachers association and retired teachers where he's talking about, OK, you know, now that you're retired and you're sitting around, be aware of these things and practice these good habits. And so oftentimes getting in front of groups and talking and becoming an expert and letting them know that, hey, you know, here's this knowledge. You can help yourself with this. If you have other questions, concerns, come and see me. Mm-hmm. We do a lot now of video stuff because you can't do in person. So we're doing a lot of YouTube videos and exercise videos and putting that out on YouTube and on our website, trying to create content to bring people in. Yep. Those things all take time. Podcasts and then the podcast editing, right? So I would say probably at least half of the time, 50% of our clinic hours on the back end are done doing business stuff and doing a lot of the things that people don't also realize of like the paperwork and the x-rays and marking x-rays like that stuff takes a lot of time on the back end Mm -hmm. and so getting new patients in is actually quite labor intensive it's way more labor intensive to get new patients in versus keeping your existing patients happy and so that's always the thing you have to remind yourself you have these patients who have been with you they're healthy they're doing great it's to actually probably spend more time with the existing patients Cherishing those relationships, keeping them happy, making sure you're serving them and meeting their needs versus chasing new patients all Mm -hmm. the time. So there's a a, a balance there, too. Now, the great thing with Dr. Dan and I is he does more of the business networking and marketing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm more of the spine geek. So I'm the one who does more of, you know, the spine research. And I focus on, I guess, the science, the research and always start trying to stay cutting edge with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And he's really good with doing the podcasts and the emails and the newsletters like he does the majority of that and i'm the one who does i guess the technical aspect cutting edge research spine stuff yeah yeah. so the two of us together it works great because we complement yeah his skills my skills right and so uh it's fantastic that's awesome yeah so i don't know if that answered your question but yeah it it absolutely did um and then sorry sorry one last note not to cut you off and then i think the other big one is We've been very fortunate, but we also try very hard. It's service, right? We've we've worked really hard at keeping patients happy mm-hmm. and providing the utmost service and never upsetting anybody. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, I think it's helped our Google reputation. Mm-hmm. And so because we have a decent or good, maybe even great Google reputation, that helps 
the marketing machine or that helps people coming in yep. because people write us Google reviews and testimonies about their experience. And so I think as new patients read those, they probably it helps them feel comfortable coming to see us because other people have had good experiences because we try very hard to have a really excellent level of service and extremely ethical. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself, in itself is a form of marketing and, and keeping things going. Right. So, and, and I can, I can attest to that. Like, I enjoy coming. Yeah. Right. Like it's a, it's a good atmosphere. Every person that you've hired that works there is friendly. They're talkative. They're outgoing. Smiling. They make you, smiling. Yeah. They make you feel good about yourself. Like yeah. they talk to you. Right. Yeah. Um, so that, that right there pushes a lot of, uh, word of mouth. Yeah. Right. Cause now everyone, you know, we want to share good things that we have about everyone wants a person. Yeah. I have a chiropractor. Yeah. You, sh you need to see them, right? Yes, yes. So that's that's one thing. Um, on the marketing side, where and who told you that Google was important? That's when good, when did that start? That's a good question, and actually, that's probably a better question for, like I said, Doctor Dan, because mm -hmm. as I came into that business six years ago now, he had already established a very good Google review reputation. And, you know, he had bought the clinic from another chiropractor. So he already had existing clientele mm -hmm. and, you know, he was building that momentum. And I think as the years that I've been there have gone on, the internet has trumped and superseded. And I think we would just start to see that I think a lot of it was organic, seeing like someone comes in and we would put referral source. How did you find out about us? Google, mm -hmm. Google, Google, Google. And we started to see that people were really finding us on the internet by the Google reviews. And I, I think it just became apparent and became more important to make sure that that reputation was first and foremost because the organic search function that people were having was really important to getting our patients in. But I think he would be the one that discovered it well before me. So that would be a question for him. Mm -hmm. When I was in the U S it was all talks, right? Mm -hmm. Google did very little. It was direct business referrals. So we were out in the community doing talks all the time, you know, yeah. dinners and so on and so forth, just educating people and saying, Hey, you know, if you have questions, come see me and building trust mm -hmm. face to face versus I guess building trust on the internet. Right. Yeah. So yeah. have you always been well-spoken uh, or, or confident in, in front of people? I, I think so. I worked hard at it uh, in school. Do, doing what? In school. I think the, the, like, it was one of those I would practice and I would record myself because okay. in school, you know, a lot of teachers told us you can become a great chiropractor. You can have great hands, mm -hmm. but if you can't get people in the door, if you can't relate to them, mm -hmm. you're not going to survive. Right. You're not going to be successful in practice because you need to be able to talk to people, communicate, understand them and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I knew that back then, same thing. A lot of the the marketing was getting out and speaking. And so anytime there was class projects, anytime there was something where someone could get up and talk and, you know, the teacher would say, OK, who wants to go first? I would just put my hand up. Let's go, mm -hmm. you know, just get over my fear, get over it, make my mistakes while I was sitting in front of school, in front of colleagues. And I think it was just practice. And then we would do groups like speaking groups after hours, we would practice speaking and then we would just be honest and criticize each other. Okay. You don't notice this, but you're fidgeting like crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. And those would be some of my things would be like fidgeting and trying not to move. And so right. for a long time, I practiced like, okay, hands in pockets, don't take those hands out of your pockets and just practice being calm, uh, slowing down. So I would say I've probably not well spoken i've always talked so fast that it's been a learning experience for me to try and slow it down interesting right and so slowing down and taking uh pauses specific pauses and waiting and waiting and waiting before saying my next words um trying not to say um so a lot of recording myself and still i do a lot of presentations like i help educate other doctors and i always record myself doing it doing the presentation prior to giving it live yeah. and i go back and listen Oh yeah, I'm stumbling here. This doesn't make sense. And so I think the best education is, is self feedback. So either people criticizing you in a, in a constructive way mm -hmm. or recording myself and watching yourself, you're never going to like it. Like listening to yourself. Watch. It's not fun, yeah, right? Never. But it's extremely valuable, you know? Right. And uh, yeah, that's the, the best way for me to learn how to, to, to become better at communication. Right. Yeah. It's um, along those lines, what's something that you failed miserably at? Mm -hmm. 
Good question. Something that I failed miserably at. Well, I think uh, the failure probably of trying to own that CrossFit gym. Mm-hmm. The, the whole thing was I, you know, to, to get into some of the details, I guess I had signed a non-compete and, you know, I, I wasn't really business savvy. So thinking I knew what I was doing and getting in and I was coaching at a CrossFit gym, but signed a non-compete and it failed in that I couldn't open that CrossFit gym. So that failure, the failure of, um, the failure of being able to open a business then led me to becoming a chiropractor. But I think that would be my biggest failure. That was a really hard time was failing at getting that CrossFit gym. I was quite depressed at first when I couldn't open it. You know, I wanted to sign papers. I wanted to get going, but then I risked going to, to court with the people who own the other gym because I was breaching the contract. Right. Right. And so not reading the contract, just signing it freely thinking, you know, everybody's good or there's no, repercussions to me doing this. Mm -hmm. And so I think that would be like one of my biggest failures was not educating myself properly on contracts, non-competes and so on and so forth. So, Mm -hmm. so now I have them read through thoroughly by a lawyer before ever signing anything. So biggest, the the biggest failure, would that then lead to the biggest kind of light bulb moment in your life? Or was there a different, did you ever have these big moments that you think back of in your life where you're just like, whatever it is, I get it now. Yeah. I didn't used to. Now I get it. Like I understand the exact time and what was it? I think that would be one of them for sure. Would yeah. be, yeah, would be that moment. Um, because it forced me to then think outside the box. What am I going to do? Where can I open a gym? Can I open a different business that's similar to the gym that will give people these health benefits that I could also teach them exercise, right? Like I started like putting down on paper all of my desires Mm -hmm. and wanted to work with people, be on my feet, not sit at a computer, help them get healthy, right? Uh, Be able to sort of run my own hours or be a, a business owner, you know, basically not be employed. And I started going through all these things and I was like, wow, full circle, right back to what I wanted to do originally. Okay. Mm -hmm. Light bulb goes off. I got to go to school. Right. And so it was an extreme light bulb moment. And then I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm six years out of my undergrad. Like, how am I going to go back to school? How is this going to work? And then finally my, my wife said like, just, just apply. What's the worst that could possibly happen. Right. Like just, just apply. And so, uh, yeah, applied, got in and then just went from there. And so that was a big aha moment. Um, I think relationships, I think, so maybe that would be some of my biggest failures too, like relationships as a young man, you know, like, Mm -hmm. uh, still one of the hardest things working on it every day, day in, day out, trying to be better because I want to be better at it. Right. But I think, oh gosh, that I fail miserably in my relationships as a young man, right? Like almost too self-involved, right? It's all about you. And so when I met my wife, light bulb went off and like it was within even probably a couple of days, I knew I'm like, I'm marrying this one. There's no doubt about it, right? The light bulb went off. Really? So, absolutely. Yeah. It, it was very different. And I was like, wow, I got to grow up. I got to do something fast. Like I got to get my, my show together. I got to get my act together because mm-hmm. I need something valuable to keep this girl around. And so part of that light bulb moment was, was meeting her and realizing how important she was to me. And then it was like, okay, I got to get my act together. Right. And so part of it was trying to open the CrossFit gym and then that failed and then to school. So, yeah. 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 So it sounds like the, 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 the first big failure was almost like the, the biggest lesson. Yes. Right. Where yep. we can, we can always learn. And I think that that in my life has, I found that we are always either if, if we're succeeding, that's great. But our biggest lessons are when we fail because we're the most willing to, to reflect on stuff right. or, and grow and try to find a day. If we're succeeding, we don't look for yep. other ways to go. Right. Yep. Um, so having said that, what will we be yours? Who, um, that's, t- that's a tough one, right? My, I, I would think, so when I look back at it, it's, you know, when I think of my stuff, it's, am I, um, do I wish it never happened? Right? Like your biggest failures, you think, you know, could something not have happened? And I think that having a a failed marriage, um, there's often times where I think, you know, what would it be like if if I didn't do this, if I didn't choose this, or if I, or if I had discovered growth and, and 
uh, awareness earlier on, would I have done something different? Um, that was the, that's probably my biggest, we'll, we'll call it a failure, but really, I mean, it's got me here. Right. And it got me to all of the different stages of my life and the, the different, uh, levels of growth that are just becoming exponential and yeah. learning and understanding that I, the more I learn, the less I know, like it's all of those cliche things that you're just like, I'm getting it. Right. Right. I'm slowly getting it. So I'm, I'm glad it happened. Yeah. It, it had to happen for me to be here. I mean, that's the only thing that I can ever believe, right. Is that, you know, maybe if I didn't do that one thing, I would have got hit by a bus the next day yep. or I would have got cancer five years later. Who knows what would happen. Right. Yeah. Um, now it, it, it kind of falls into the thing of like, where have you been the most influenced? What, what's been the biggest influence on you, whether it's been, uh, books that you've read, which by the way, the book, uh, by Carol Dweck, Yes. Mindset. Book, yeah. It's a great book. Right. Okay. I yeah. dove into it yeah. right after. Easy to you read too. About it. Right. It's quick. It's easy. Yeah. Some great things that you can implement and take away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I use it. I try to use it. I, you know, like with, with parenting, like parenting can be tough. You obviously have two kids. You get it right. When yeah. in those moments where things happen, you try not to get heated. You got to like keep calm and think, okay, what do I say? What can I do here to help my child grow? Hence the growth mindset as opposed to potentially imposing limiting beliefs on them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that book I think is a lot too in how my, my dad's mindset growing up was that type of like open growth mindset, go get them. Don't let anything stop you. If you're going to fall down, get back up, get after it again, just basically ingraining me with a growth mindset. So I think that had a really strong influence on confidence at a young age, mm -hmm. not necessarily confidence in talking, but just confidence that no matter what you could do it, don't let anybody stop you. Yeah. So I think that was pivotal in my influence uh, as a young man in the next phase in life. Pivotal would have been in chiropractic school following uh, the, the doctors Harrison's their, their research was extremely pivotal on a uh, pivot, pivotal on where my education, where my career took me in chiropractic. And I am so grateful for that, that I gravitated towards that, mm -hmm. you know, and then I actually loved the, the weird spine stuff, you know, the engineering spine models mm -hmm. that was extremely uh, influential on me at that point in my life. And I think what would have the most influence on me now would be my kids. Mm -hmm. I think that's like one of the greatest influences learning experiences it's like humbling they have it's, no filters no right yeah. so when they say something you know that they mean it yeah right they're a huge they can teach us so many lessons and it's one of those things like you don't want to do it wrong like every day i worry am i doing this right you know what i mean like yeah and i think probably every single parent has that in their mind as yep. you're raising your children am i doing this right am mm -hmm. i trying hard enough could i do a better job and so i and think what's your answer Oh, what's it, what's your I always think I could do better. I yep. always think I could do better, Dan. That's yep. just, that's just something, you know, in school, for instance, that's why, you know, not that I was trying to be valedictorian. I was just, that was my work ethic of mm -hmm. let's work harder because I think I can do better. Let me work harder. I think I could do better. Right. So same thing with parenting. I always think I can do better. Right. And so they influence me in trying to watch their behavior and their joy for life and their simplicity of like, the joy of just playing with Legos or get up singing and dancing and just being in a great mood. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm trying to use them, their energy to like, I guess, become a better parent and give that back. And that's part of that slowing down is slowing down sometimes and not trying to necessarily even just teach them something, but be present be. in the moment with them, yep. play, enjoy life in its simplicity with them. Beautiful. And that's, I would say with where they're influencing me is like the smallest little wins, the smallest little things yep. that bring great joy, but it's just being there with them. So that one day down the road, they say, well, dad, you didn't play with me enough or dad, you didn't do this enough because I was too busy trying to put all the other pieces uh, together, like a Tetris puzzle, if you will. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, they're influencing my life greatly now. Right. In a good way, but in a very humbling way. I, <laughs> so am I doing it right? I know exactly what you mean. I think I'm doing a decent job, but yeah. I want to always do better. So I constantly try. My wife is amazing. Yeah. She's a really great parent, but she's a teacher. You know, I shouldn't say, but she was a teacher by trade. Her whole families are teachers and they're mm -hmm. like extremely loving. They are just down to earth 
people that are wonderful, loving with each other. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, having them as like role models with kids is unbelievable. So our kids are, are lucky. I would say, yeah, actually, my kids um, are lucky. not because of me, because of having my wife and the, like that, that level of love from, from her and all these educators that are really good at like helping early childhood yeah. brains develop. Like it's, it's unbelievable to watch them and how they know how to interact with these kids to help them. But that's years of managing children in schools. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, it's impressive. Well, yeah. don't short, don't short suit yourself. I mean, in listening about your dad and your family and I mean, he was pivotal in in setting you up for success. Right. And mindset is a massive thing. So, um, I, I think you're even the way you are in your clinic with your patients, let alone your kids who are seeing a lot of it, right. Kids, kids hear very little about what we say and everything about what we do. So I appreciate that. uh, I think you should, it's always easier to, to look back and, and really be a little more gentle on ourselves as far as that, because I ask those same questions pretty much every day. Yeah. Um, I know we have a hard stop. I know I want to be respectful of your time. We have about a minute here, wow. but, but what's something that um, people should be asking you? What's something that people aren't that either someone hasn't asked you or whether it's about you, about chiropractic, about fishing, about life in general, anything they want that they should be asking me is probably why I go to bed so early. <laughs> I think, right. Sometimes people find out about it and they, then they do ask and they're How curious about it. Uh, oftentimes like last night I was probably asleep. A lot of times I'm asleep before nine and in the winter times there's days I'll be asleep by seven forty at night. It's crazy. Right. And I mean, that's Sounds just, amazing. that's just like going with the flow <laughs> knowing that down the road with kids as they get older, I won't be able to probably sleep as much, yeah. but I need it. And especially if they're waking up at night, okay. but, um, I have prioritized sleep and I think, you know, there's all the things we talked about. I love physical activity, right? That's my number one. I think nutrition and sleep are like, uh, they're juggling hard for the second, but I think sleep is like the fountain of youth, but I think it has to do with people's mindset, right? Like waking up, feeling refreshed, my ability to take on the day and want to be a leader is, uh, is very different than if I'm lack sleep or if I've, if I've gotten disturbed. And so I think the question people should be asking me is like, what time should I go to bed? You know, what, what would be appropriate for me in terms of sleep? Cause I think it varies for everybody. Yeah, yeah. And I think that eight hours is still, to me, it's not enough. I think for me in a perfect world, it's nine hours to 10 hours every night of good quality sleep to stay healthy, functional, and have great energy. I feel like this is like, we've got a lot of things in common. That we, yeah, yeah. Maybe another one with maybe even Dr. Dan here, as far as like diving for sure. Well, deep into things. And but, I think he would love to do it. He would enjoy it for sure. Oh, that'd yeah. be great. Um, so, you know, we'll wrap up here. I really, I mean, I have to commend you. I'm, you know, you are the sum of the people that, you're around and that you talk to and you listen to and you know over the last little bit just being under your your care um getting to know you uh being able to have you here like i have to i have to commend you your your mindset you know the way you present yourself the the friends that you have the people that you surround yourself with and and the the life that you live as far as you practice what you're preaching trying to and that to me is like the ultimate goal um you know the the growth and growing and everything like that it's um i have to commend you on that and it it really ties it together so i i appreciate it i'm glad to be under your care i'm glad to uh to know you and i really appreciate you being here today well all those things right back at you thank you for having me it's been an honor and yeah, I'm very humbled and honored that you even asked me to do this. And I'd love to do it again sometime if you want to. And uh, I guess vice versa, we'll have to have you on our podcast in the clinic. Yeah. And if you'd like to, I'd yeah, love to bet. put you on the spot and get a yes from you. you. Bet. <laughs> then we'll have you Why on. are home builders crux? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, I get it. All right. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. All right, Dan.